Almost 15 months have passed since the historic test at Stennis Space Center, the so-called Green Run, and this went so incredibly well, granted after a failure the first time around, but the second time the engines went for 8 minutes and 20 seconds before performing a controlled shutdown as expected. This was so encouraging. I really felt that SLS and Artemis 1 was finally going to be getting off the ground soon. And yet, here we are in early June, just pushing SLS back out to the launch pad to conduct another wet rehearsal, which really is nothing more significant or complicated than the green run was, except that we're going to be testing the launch tower and the ICPS, both of which failed the first time we tried this. And as you may have noticed in my previous video about this subject, there are some very good reasons reasons that it did fail and if you haven't seen that video by the way stop this video and go back to the previous one which I have linked right here and also in the description. But as NASA gets ready to give this whole thing a second go, the whole Artemis 1 mission seems just as remote and just as impossible as these children's animations that I've started to enjoy watching from the NASA Johnson Space Center. It is just so sad and so frustrating to see Artemis 1 delayed until August at the earliest, which was a date the, that only the pessimists talked about. Even I didn't think that Artemis 1 would be delayed this long, and yet it most definitely is. And even if this does fly in August, Artemis 2 and Artemis 3 will still be using this deeply flawed launch tower until we finally have a replacement. And as of just a few days ago, the Office of Inspector General came out with a withering report on the replacement for the mobile launch tower, something that's supposed to be much more solid than this cobbled together piece of junk that they're currently using and the picture is not good not in the least and even if SLS performs perfectly through Artemis 1 2 and 3 and successfully returns us to the moon which is quite a stretch by the way the problems that were recently revealed by the office of inspector general may sabotage Artemis immediately after our return to the moon. Hello YouTube, I'm the Angry Astronaut and this is... So as I explained in my previous video on this subject, the current mobile launch tower is a cobbled together piece of garbage that was originally not even intended for SLS, was a shared disaster between multiple contractors, and nobody has a clear idea of what the overall design of this launch tower is. Therefore, any problems that it may experience in the future will be very difficult to track down, identify, and correct. This is simply not the mobile launch tower for the Artemis program. Like so many other things associated with Artemis, it is a cost-cutting measure utilizing equipment that was never designed for lunar missions to go to the moon, and using this kind of approach has been deeply flawed. So, NASA came out with a plan for something called ML2 or Mobile Launch 2, obviously a much better launch launch tower, at least that's the theory, with a new contractor who presumably would not screw the whole thing up and would have one overall design that was specifically intended for the SLS. However, the problems have already been evident. Quote, the ML2's substantial cost increases and schedule delays can be attributed primarily to Bechtel's, by the way, that's the new contractor, poor performance on the contract with more than 70% or $421.1 million of the contract's cost increases and over 1.5 years of delay related to its performance. For example, Bechtel underestimated the ML2 project scope and complexity, experienced ML2 weight management challenges and experienced staffing turnover and retention issues. Additionally, Bechtel's lack of a certified EVMS since inception of the ML2 
you contract a contractually required tool for measuring and assessing project performance has limited NASA's insight into the project's cost and schedule issues. By the way, EVMS, they briefly define what that is, but I was interested to get some more details as to what that actually is. And EVM stands for Earned Value Management. And what it does is provide guidance for the effective application, implementation, and utilization of EVM on NASA programs, major contracts, and subcontracts in a consolidated reference document. EVM is a project management process that effectively integrates a project's scope of work with schedule and cost elements for optimum project planning and control. That sounds like a hell of a good idea. And guess what? This contractor doesn't have anybody who's certified in this policy. What the hell? But according to the Office of Inspector General, we can't put all of the responsibility on Bechtel. Quote, Bechtel's performance notwithstanding, NASA's management practices contributed to the project's cost increases and schedule delays. NASA awarded the ML2 contract while the exploration upper stage, the primary reason NASA needed a second mobile launcher, lacked final requirements, impacting the ML2 design. With respect to contract management. While NASA withheld award fees for a six-month performance period in spring of 2021 due to Bechtel's poor performance, the agency did not continue this practice despite the contractor's continued poor performance in the subsequent award period. Therefore, we question nearly $3 million in award fees NASA awarded to Bechtel for this period. NASA is not learning a damn thing throughout this entire disaster. Once again, NASA is awarding bonuses to a contractor that's doing a terrible job without sufficient oversight or consistency when it comes to enforcing their own policies. And the consequences of these wasteful policies are simply disastrous, not just in terms of schedule delays, but also in terms of cost. The base contract value for ML2 was 380 million dollars as of February of 2022 the estimate estimated cost rather for ml2 at completion will be nine hundred and sixty million one hundred and twenty eight thousand seven hundred and eleven dollars nearly one billion dollars for something that should have cost a little bit more than a third of a billion and that's as of right now we're not even close to getting this thing done and estimated costs have all already almost tripled. But why do we really need the ML2? I mean, aside from the fact that the original launch tower is not very reliable and still cobbled together, couldn't we just fix the damn thing or just get it functional enough to work? Well, no, that's not the case. ML2 is needed for a variety of reasons. First of all, for Artemis 4 and beyond, we're going to need the SLS Block 1B, and that that is going to require a number of modifications. First of all, the crew access arm and egress systems, while remaining the same, are going to have to be located further up the tower simply because SLS Block 1B is taller. On top of that, it's going to need a new vehicle damper system because of the extended length of the SLS Block 1B. On top of that, it's going to need new upper stage umbilicals, and this is because the ICPS or interim cryogenic propulsion stage is going to be replaced by the far more ambitious exploration upper stage, which will have four RL-10 engines instead of just one, providing almost 100,000 pounds of thrust instead of less than 25,000. This makes a very, very big difference as to the amount of cargo that the SLS can carry all the way to the moon. Why is this important? Well, it's because of the lunar gate gateway, which by the way is going to be fully deployed by Artemis 4. 
Once the two astronaut Artemis 3 mission is complete, the Lunar Gateway is going to require a much larger life support module in order to sustain four astronauts for a sustained period of time. And this is not going to be possible without something called the IHAB module that's being built by the European Space Agency and the Talos Alenia company. This is a very big module, something that would be pretty easy to deliver to low Earth orbit but very, very difficult to get it all the way out to the Lunar Gateway. Even the current SLS can't deliver it, and certainly not any commercial rockets. Even the Falcon Heavy would be incapable of delivering this module. It requires the SLS Block 1B, or perhaps the Starship, assuming that it's fully functional by that time. Either way, you're going to need a very substantial change in logistics in order to get this module all the way out to the gateway. And without this module, Artemis missions involving more than two astronauts will simply not be possible. The existing lunar gateway with the Halo module, which is little more than a tiny tin can out in lunar orbit, will not be capable of handling four astronauts, even with the Orion's life support system attached. We need this module in order to be able to carry out the more ambitious ambitious parts of Artemis, which means we need the Block 1B, which means we need the Mobile Launch 2. All of these things are looking more and more unlikely as time goes by, and as you keep going in the Office of Inspector General report, things just don't look any more optimistic. Quote, additional management issues contribute to Bechtel's poor performance and will likely continue to negatively affect the ML2 project. Several other interrelated issues contributed to Bechtel's poor performance on the ML2 project, many of which will likely continue to affect the contract in the future, including Bechtel's reluctance to utilize NASA's expertise in subsystem development, weight management and mitigation challenges, lack of risk management, and staffing turnover and retention. Additionally, Bechtel's lack of a certified EVMS since inception of the ML2 contract contract has limited the agency's insight into project cost and schedule issues, and it just keeps getting worse. During 2021, Bechtel stopped identifying and tracking technical risks to the project. Let me say that again. Bechtel stopped identifying and tracking technical risks to the project. What the hell? How can you possibly get away with that? Not even tracking any sort of project problems or risks that you have in something as important as a launch platform? Anyway, we'll continue. According to ML2 project officials, Bechtel project management was focused instead on developing new cost and schedule estimates rather than identifying risks that could impact cost, schedule, and performance later in the project. Although NASA requested updated cost and schedule estimates in December 2020 to better inform its ABC development efforts, the agency did not direct Bechtel to pause other efforts such as risk assessment. So what's the bottom line here? Well, the OIG sums it up pretty well. Quote, in addition to the launcher's significant cost increases, Bechtel expects a scheduled delay of at least two and a half years for delivery of the ML-2 to NASA. When the ML-2 contract was first awarded in June of 2019, Bechtel was required to deliver the ML-2 structure to NASA by March of 2023. However, as of February of 2022, the company's projected delivery date is October of 2025. After Bechtel delivers the, the launcher to NASA, the ML2 project will need at least an additional six to nine months to ensure the launcher systems are safe and work as intended, a process known as verification and validation. Next, the ML2 project needs approximately seven more months to complete launch operations, such as placing the SLS on the ML2 
and moving it to the launch pad rather on the crawler transporter. As a result, due to the contract delays in combination with NASA's required steps after delivery, the earliest an Artemis 4 launch could occur would be November of 2026. And I would say 2027 is probably way more realistic. That being the case, if we complete Artemis 3 by 2023, by 2027, we'll have an updated lunar gateway and the earliest we can expect astronauts to return to the moon after Artemis 3 will be 2028 three years after the completion of Artemis 3. That is simply unacceptable and frankly difficult to believe. We need an alternative, and there are a couple. We can use Lunar Starship, or we can look at the possibility of refueling Orion or whatever el- whatever other equipment rather is needed in LEO. We need to start looking for other alternatives to this outdated, non-reusable, and ridiculously expensive system, but I have to admit I'm not very optimistic and I wish I had better things to report. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, and also please follow me on Twitter because I have some very exciting things to announce for this channel coming up in the near future. So until NASA actually has a legitimate and viable system to return mankind to the moon to stay until we have something far Far better than what we're looking at right now. I urge all of you to stay angry about space.